as we look into the Word of God, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8. For those of you who might have come in late this morning, this is our basket for our love offering for the family that I talked to you about last Sunday. And uh, if you can give and help that family today, it sure would be appreciated. All right. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Amen, 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 amen. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8. Amen. Amen. Let's get in agreement. Amen. Let the Word of God get into us. Amen. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8. Amen. If I could speak to you today about a subject or a thought, it would be the power of the spoken word. Say what? Say what? Power. Of the spoken word. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8. Everybody say amen. 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 Let's look at it together. Let's do, let's do something together, Cole. I don't, I don't know. Maybe we, maybe we need to read in concert today. You know what that means? Yes. That means if you've got a Bible and you can read with the, what's going on on the, on the prompt, then let's read it together, okay? Amen. Begin to read in verse 8. The Bible said, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, uh, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, uh, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, uh, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I, I will come and heal him. Uh, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy uh, that you should come under my roof, uh, but only speak a word, or speak the word only, and my servant uh, will be healed. Uh, for I also am a man under authority, having soldiers uh, under me. And I say to this one, go and he goes and another come uh, and he comes and, and, and he comes and to my servant do this uh, and he does it. Uh, and when Jesus heard it he marveled uh, and said to those who followed uh, assuredly I say to you I have not found uh, such great faith not even uh, in Israel. And I say to you uh, that many will come from the east and west and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob uh, in the kingdom of heaven uh, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping uh, and and gnashing of teeth. Uh, then Jesus said to the centurion, uh, Go your way as you have believed, uh, so let it be done for you. Uh, and his servant was healed uh, that same hour. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for today, God. Father, we thank you for the Spirit and the Word for the God. And I thank you for how they work together, God. Uh, but I thank you for how they are in agreement for the God. And Father, we just want to be in agreement uh, with what you want to do in this house today for the God. Uh, Father, we pray that we might be surrendered to your work and your will for the God. Uh, and Father, I pray the Holy Ghost of God will speak to us and speak through us. God. Uh, but I pray that the name of Jesus be blessed above every name. Uh, I pray you be glorified in every way for the God. Uh, but I pray that you loosen the straps of our tongue. Lord, I pray you anoint us that we might be able to preach, uh, to be instant in season, out of season for the God. And I pray God the word of God uh, will go forth in this house today for the God. And Father, I pray it will sit down on hearts. Uh, I pray it will change minds for the God. I pray it will transform us. Uh, Lord, I pray God there be a work in this house for the God that none uh, could stay the hand of the Lord God. Uh, I pray for the influence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, in such a way for the God to take this word and permeate us in our minds uh, and our hearts today for the God saturate us God uh, let it flow like the oil that come off of Aaron's beard for the God uh, Lord I pray today for the God that there be a move of the Holy Ghost uh, in this house today for the God uh, Lord I pray the Holy Ghost would speak and have voice in here God uh, and Lord I pray God that we would hear the word of the Lord uh, and what you got to say to the church today for the God uh, Father this is a new day uh, a new dawning an opportunity a time that you brought us to uh, into the kingdom God and I pray God that we follow you uh, and we chase hard after you, God, and what you want to do and how you want to do it, God, that you might be seen, that evidence might come, that a witness might be brought forth for the God, that testimony might be of us, that we serve the true and the living God, and there's no God like our God. Father, we love you. We commit this word into your hands. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and amen and amen. Everybody, please be seated. Matthew Gospel, chapter 8. The Roman centurion. The Bible said in verse 5, Now when Jesus had entered into Capernaum, uh, a centurion came to him, uh, pleading with him, uh, uh, beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, uh, sick of the palsy, uh, dreadfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy. You should come under my roof. Uh, only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Uh, he said, For I also am a man uh, under uh, authority. Uh, as we look in this passage of Scripture today, we find the Lord Jesus Christ uh, has come back to Capernaum. Uh, 
Now, I want you to understand that Capernaum was situated on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee in such a place that Magdala would be on the northwesternmost point and then the place where Jesus had fed the 5,000, the place where he preached the Sermon on the Mount, the place where he restored Peter in John's Gospel, chapter 21, after he had denied the Lord Jesus three times. That place was about three miles from Magdala. And if you went about three more miles, you would come to a place called Capernaum. And that was Jesus' home base for ministry when he was doing the work and the will of God his Father. You remember he was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth. But he had a home base of ministry called Capernaum. And many miracles and signs and wonders Jesus did in this town of Capernaum. But here in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus is coming in the western gate of the town of Capernaum and there is a Roman centurion who meets Jesus and the Bible said that his servant was sick. He was paralyzed, sick of the palsy. I don't know what happened to him. The Bible don't say maybe a stroke. I don't know. All I know is that he was sick, grievously tormented. He was at the doorsteps of death and he comes to Jesus and he comes and when we preach this passage many times or you've read this passage, this is a scripture about great faith. Great faith because Jesus said, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel, but I find that faith in a Roman centurion, somebody who's not even a child of God, somebody who's not even saved, somebody who ain't even born again, somebody who's not a believer and following after me, but I found some faith that's greater than even the faith of those who claim to be the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I found some faith in this Gentile who come to Jesus in need for what his servant and what Jesus could supply. Because he knew, the Bible said in Luke's Gospel chapter 7, that he heard that Jesus was coming. He heard that Jesus could heal. He heard that Jesus made the deaf to hear and the lame to talk and the lame to walk. He heard that Jesus had healed blinded eyes and cleansed the leper and raised the dead back to life. I just wish somebody would talk about him sometimes. Somebody would give him glory for what he's done. Because if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ... I don't know about you, but I know where I'd be. But thanks be unto God. I'm thankful today that he had mercy on me. I didn't deserve his mercy. I wasn't worthy of his mercy. But God had so great a grace that met me on the road of life, took me up out of the miry clay, washed me with the blood of Jesus, changed my life, wrote my name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I got to tell somebody about what Jesus has done for me. Oh, because he helped me, he'll help you, amen. He'll do for you what he done for somebody else. He is no respect to a person, praise God. God will do when nobody else will do, amen. Somebody told him about Jesus. He heard all that Jesus had done. And so he comes to find Jesus, to see Jesus. And he comes with great faith. Great faith. But there's two things, because Jesus, the Bible says, marveled at what he said. He marveled. Now listen to me. That word marveled means shocked. And so if you're going to shock Jesus, you've done something now. Now, I ain't talking about shocking me. I ain't talking about shocking you. I ain't talking about opening my eyes. I ain't causing, I'm ta- talking about causing us to be wonder and wild eyed. He shocked Jesus. Marvel. The only other time uh, that I read in the Gospels uh, that Jesus marveled uh, was in Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. Uh, he marveled uh, at the unbelief uh, of those uh, in Nazareth. His own town where he was raised that they would not even believe in who he said he was. He marveled at their unbelief. But now he's marveling at such great faith. This question come to my mind. Why did he marvel? What made him marvel? There's two things that are embedded in this passage of scripture that if you really want to shock Jesus... If you really want Jesus to marvel, 
If you really want to know what great faith is, then these two things are critical and necessary in my life and in your life for seeing Jesus do what Jesus is able to do. Watch the Bible. The Bible says in chapter 8 and in verse 9, let's start. I'm going to start with the last one first and the first one to be last, okay? But these are two things. The Bible said in verse 9, For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, another come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. He marveled. He marveled uh, because this centurion came to Jesus uh, and said, I also, I also am a man uh, under authority. Uh, he said, Jesus, uh, I am uh, just uh, like you. Now, what are you saying, preacher? He was saying to Jesus, I, I am a man under authority. He was a Roman centurion. He had a hundred soldiers that he was in charge over, that he had command over. He had authority over them, but he was also a man who was under authority. He had the authority of another man, another man, authority of Rome and the empire and Caesar that was over him. But if you ever rebelled against the authority that was over him. He could never keep it together with the authority that was under him. I need to talk to somebody today about authority that we have in the word of God, the spirit of God, and the name of Jesus. Because those are three areas in the Christian life that you and I have authority as born again believers. Okay? Understand this, you have authority through the Word of God. The Word of God, the authority that you have to speak that Word, to speak that Word and the power and the prevailing of that Word over your mountain, over your giant, over your circumstance, over your situation because of the power of the Word of God. And listen to me, Hebrews 4 and 12 says uh, that the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Uh, he said, piercing and dividing asunder even soul and spirit, joint and marrow, uh, and discerning even to the intents uh, or the thoughts uh, of our hearts. Okay? Now let's just break that down real quick because if you're going to understand the power of the word, uh, you got to understand the verse uh, that declares the power of the word. We can quote it, but we don't really understand it. <laughs> it does you no good to quote it. If you can't understand it uh, and grow strength from it uh, and understand that this is what God says uh, and this is what I believe. The word is quick and powerful. It's living uh, and it's active. Uh, it is a two-edged sword. Uh, the region he calls it a two-edged sword, uh, it means in the Greek, uh, it's two-mouthed. Uh, it means twice spoken. Uh, if you understand that, uh, then you understand uh, the reason it is living uh, is because God uh, spoke it first. It's living and active. It's quick and it's powerful. It is living, powerful because God spoke it. It's his word. Listen to me. In the beginning when God created everything and all things by himself, the Bible says that he didn't wave a magic wand and say, let it be created. The Bible says he didn't even touch it and make it. The Bible said uh, he spoke it uh, into existence uh, with the power uh, of his word. That's the creative capacity uh, of the God uh, that you and I serve. Yes. He is creative uh, in his power. Uh, just the word spoken uh, will bring it uh, to pass. And listen to me. He said, let there be light. And bless God, there was light. He called the dry land uh, up out of the sea, uh, and the dry land uh, came up out uh, of the sea. He spoke uh, the greater light by day uh, and the lesser light by night, uh, and bless and behold, there was a sun uh, and a moon. That's our God. Listen to me. He spoke uh, the fowl in the air, uh, the fish in the sea, uh, and the beasts uh, in the field. Uh, he spoke it all uh, into existence. Uh, he is the living God, uh, and his word uh, is living. Amen. 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 But it's a two-edged sword. You got to speak the word of God. It's activated through your tongue. 
That's why it's two-edged. He spoke it once, uh, but it can't do you no good just because he spoke it. Uh, you, under the authority uh, and the influence of the Holy Spirit, uh, have to speak uh, the word uh, of God. There's too many of God's people say, well, I'm just thinking about it, preacher. If I just think about it, no, God, no, you got to speak the word of God. It's got to come out of your mouth. The devil's cheating you. He's robbing you. He's kicking your butt up one side of the street and down the other side of the street because you're ashamed to speak the word of God. You got to declare the word. It's authority that we have through the word. There's authority that comes through the Holy Spirit uh, as the Holy Spirit uh, begins to work in you and through you. Uh, and we line ourselves up uh, with the will of God the Father. The Holy Spirit uh, begins to take ev evidence and influence over our life uh, because we are now filled with the Spirit. You've been indwelled with the Spirit, uh, but you need to be filled uh, with the Holy Ghost of God. Uh, wherein if there do not be filled with wine, uh, wherein is excess, uh, but be ye filled uh, with the Spirit uh, of God. You got to come up under the influence uh, of the Holy Spirit. Now, the thing about authority is uh, you'll never have authority uh, until you submit to God. Surrender to God. See, because too many people uh, have a commitment toward God. As long as you got a commitment toward God, you can uncommit at any time. <laughs> but whenever you surrender to God... You just throw, somebody stuck a gun in your face, what are you going to do? I'm, I'm going to be like this. I, I, you have all my money, my car, whatever, you get to take it. I don't need it. God's got more of it. My life ain't worth it, amen. You, you do whatever you need. You're going to surrender, amen. And that's exactly what God has called us to do if we're going to have this authority that we need to have and can have as born-again believers. You have got to submit and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. Listen to me. You can pray the prayer. You can pray to you blue in the face. You can quote the scripture as much as you want to quote the scripture. You can rebuke the devil in Jesus' name all you want to rebuke the devil in Jesus' name. If you are not surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ, you don't have any authority in what you're doing or what you're saying. This is about authority. Authority. Listen to me. We all pray and stuff, asking God for stuff. Want God to move in stuff, work in stuff. And we ain't heard no answer from God. We ain't seen God do nothing with it yet. And we talk about, well, we got an adversary and there's opposition. And we talk about how, uh, uh, you know, we just got to wait on the Lord sometimes. You got to be patient. I know what it is to wait on the Lord. I know what it is to be patient with God. I know what it is to have an adversary that won't, don't want you to get the answer that God has for your prayer. But sometimes you need to take a step back and talk to God and with boldness and courage say, God, what's going on? Yes. Because, God, I, I, I need to know if it's me, Lord, I need you to reveal in me what it is that's keeping this prayer from being answered, that's keeping me from seeing the victory, that's not allowing me to overcome, that's not seeing the healing that I know you able to give, God. I know you can. So, Lord, whatever it is, just reveal it to me so I can repent of it, confess it, and find grace and forgiveness and go on and see the handiwork of the Lord. Lord, my God. Sometimes uh, it ain't got nothing to do with the devil. Uh, it ain't got nothing to do with waiting on the Lord. Uh, it's got everything to do with you. And you ain't submitted. You ain't surrendered. And you can't have that authority that comes through the word, that comes in the spirit, or in Jesus' name. Let, 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 let me help you just a minute. When Jesus went to the cross and laid down his life, he went to the cross and took our place. He died as the Lamb of God, slain for the sins of the world. He laid his life down. He became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took our place as the Lamb of God. 
But three days later, early, one Sunday morning, the Bible said he got up and he got up with all power in his hand. Amen. He got up and he got the keys of the kingdom and he took them away from the devil. And now the Bible declares in Matthew 28, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Bless God. The authority of the Lord Jesus Christ because he died at the Lamb, but he got up at the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He died to be the Savior of the world, but he rose again to be the Lord of our lives. And you can't claim him just as Savior and not have him at the Lord in your life. You better get submitted and surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ if you're going to see victory and you're going to overcome and God is going to do what God is able to do. Amen. Too many people want to be saved. But don't everybody want to do what the Lord wants them to do. Too many people want to go to heaven when they die. But they don't want to live for Jesus while they're here. There's something wrong with that. You got to come up under the Lordship. He is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. That's the truth. Ain't that right, William? I'm telling the truth, ain't I? That's between me and William, amen? I'm telling the truth. Jesus Christ died. So you could be forgiven, but he rose again so that you could conquer death, hell, and the grave. And you could live above sin and live a life of honor and glory and not reproach before God Almighty and before everybody else in this world that they might see a witness and some evidence and a testimony in your life that you are who you say you are. That you have what you say you have. That you can do what you say you can do on the authority of the Word, the Spirit, and Jesus' name. Authority. Authority. It's a must. It's a must to defeat the devil. It's a must. It's a have to. It's critical. It's paramount. It's pertinent. It's every P you can think of. And it's possible. And then, I could have really made this too messy, but the Lord will help me today. He said in verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only. Speak the word only. The power of the spoken word. So you can have authority. Through Jesus and the Holy Spirit and authority in the word and through the word but not until you come up under the word and come up under the Holy Spirit and come up under the Lordship of Jesus Christ if you don't come up under that authority you can't take authority what should be under your feet do you know the devil's supposed to be under your feet as a child of God as a child of God, you are more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. You are an overcomer through the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony because you love not this life unto death. You are a child of the Most High God. You are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our brother in the faith because we are in him and he is in us. He said in John 15 and 7, Ask what, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, whatever you desire, ask it and you shall. I'll receive it. Is the word abiding in you? That means the word dwells in you. It tabernacles in you. It ain't just something you hear somebody preach on Sunday. It's something you live out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Hallelujah. You, you meditate upon the Word of God. You let the Word of God be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. You let it chart and give you direction. It is your compass. It is what God uses to influence you and to direct you and give you guidance and to show you His will and His way. It's through the Word. Numbers chapter 13. If you can go there, you can go to Genesis, Esther, Leviticus, Numbers. Amen. No, Numbers chapter 14. Um, most of the time we preach, we preach from chapter 13. Most of you know what chapter 13 is. 
Any Bible readers in the house this morning? Anybody know what number 13 is? Good God Almighty. <laughs> it's where Moses sent the 12 spies into the promised land. One from each tribe. And the Bible says at the end of chapter 13, they came out of the promised land. They said, oh, uh, uh, it, it's everything that God said it would be, uh, but it's full of giants. Ten of them did. Ten of them said, we can't take it as full of giants as we are in our own eyes. We are in their eyes. That, that means that as, as you see yourself, that's the way the giants see you. As you say about yourself, that's the way the giants say about you. And so they said, we can't take it. But Joshua and Caleb rose up and said, oh, yeah, we can. Let's go take it now. <laughs> right now. We didn't got to wait. God said it's ours. Uh, rise up right now. We go in and take it. But the Bible says, beginning in chapter 14, uh, that the people wept and they cried all the congregation. They wept and they cried and because they said, uh, uh, why, why did you bring us out here in this wilderness to die? They said, we could have died in Egypt. We could have died in this wilderness. Why, why did you bring us all the way out here? Uh, uh, and then the Bible says uh, that they said, let us get us another leader. We don't like the man of God, Moses. Uh, that we, uh, we need to find another preacher. We need another preacher. Somebody preach us what we want to hear, what we want what we want him to say. Uh, we get another preacher, we'll be all right. He'll take us back to Egypt. We just want to go back to Egypt. Uh, and we need somebody to take us back across this old Red Sea uh, so we can get back to Egypt, back to who we was before we ever met this man named Moses. I think somebody had forgot how good God had been to you. You forgot what God done for you. Can, can you remember when you was in Egypt? You done come too far. Too many people done come, move too far in grace. They done forgot where God brought them from. Praise God, when you was in Egypt, you didn't have enough. That's where you was at in Egypt. They didn't never have enough. They was always running in lack. They never had plenty. They were always, always at the bottom of the barrel. They were always needing more. You remember when the Egyptians made it hard for them and they took away the straw and they had to go get their own straw to make the brick and to make the bricks out of the mud and the straw. And they were always coming up lack. They were always living in a place of little to nothing. And they, they, they didn't have, they didn't have enough. And then God delivered them. Oh, hallelujah. That's, that's like, that's for us, it's like being saved. Hallelujah. God delivered them out of Egypt. Amen. <laughs> brought them out with the blood of the lamb. Amen. He brought them out. And then, and then he took them through the Red Sea. And through the Red Sea for us, uh, it, uh, the New Testament says like baptism. They come through the Red Sea, amen. They're on the other side of the Red Sea. Uh, and God has taken them somewhere. Uh, but now, uh, instead of not enough, they got just enough. Just enough. Just enough because God is providing for them every day. Every day. They go outside the tent door in that manner. That miracle from bread comes down from heaven. That wonder bread laying on the ground. Out there all over the place. They gather it up. They're making whatever they need to eat that day. And the next day. God comes again. That wonder bread falling out of heaven. That miracle manna coming down every day because God wanted them to come to a place of dependency and trust and leaning on him and to know that God will provide and what God provides is sufficient for today. Take no thought for tomorrow for tomorrow will take thought for itself. God has you today. Amen. Amen. But God was taking them somewhere. And it wasn't just to a place where just enough. It was to a place called more than enough. It was to a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of plenty. It's a land uh, that was in abundance. Uh, it was a land uh, where the grapes were so big uh, that two men had to tote them uh, on a stick between their shoulders uh, when they came out of the promised land. That's what God uh, was carrying them to. But listen to the word of God. The Bible says uh, in verse 26... Chapter 14, and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long uh, shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? Uh, I have heard the complaints uh, which the children of Israel make against me. Uh, say to them, As I live, says the Lord, uh, just as you have spoken in my hearing, uh, so I will do it uh, to you. Did you hear what he said? You need to underline that. Just as you have spoken in my hearing, so will I do it unto you. Just as you have spoken, so will I do. Just as you have spoken, so will I do. You say, how did God get to that place? 
The Bible says that after they complained and murmured against God, that Moses interceded. He went to petition God. He said, God, forgive them of their iniquities. God said, I will forgive them of their iniquities. He said, I will pardon their iniquities. In verse 22, he said, but they have tested me these ten times. Ten times. Ten times. Ten times times. God had forgiven them and blessed them. 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 Ten times God had pardoned their iniquities to the point where God said, I've had enough. And he changed his mind. God reserves the right to change his mind. He's God. He can do that. He said, I swore to your fathers. He said, but I done changed my mind. He said, I ain't going to do it for you. I'll do it for the next generation, but I will not do it for you. you your carcasses are going to fall in this wilderness. You're going to die in this place. Listen, he called them an evil congregation. <laughs> listen, 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 listen. These are church folks. <laughs> this is the saved bunch. This is the one supposed to be walking by faith and not by sight. This, this is the one that, uh, that he brought out and called his own and said, you my people and I'm your God. And then he called them an evil congregation. He wasn't talking about the dope dealers and the dope smokers and the, and the drunkards. He, he, that ain't, that ain't, all that's wrong, but he wasn't talking about them. He wasn't talking about the fornicators and the adulterers. That's wrong too, but that's not who he's talking about. Uh, he wasn't talking about the, the gossipers huh, and the liars huh, and the cheats huh, and the stealers. Uh, that, oh, that's wrong, but, that, but that, that, that's not who he's talking about. <coughs> he's talking about those who claim to know him. Claim to be his own. He said, you evil congregation." You say, how in the world could God call them evil? What had they done? Read the next line. He said, who complain against me? <laughs> who complain against me? That's why I called them evil. Oh, God Almighty, what's God saying about us? Because you think, well, this is the Old Testament. That's for them that's under law. Let me speed you up just a minute. Let's go to Ephesians 4 and 29. He said in Ephesians 4 and 29, let no corrupt or evil communication come out of your mouth. You know what corrupt or evil communication is? Complaining. Complaining. Grumbling, murmuring. We complain about everything. Everything. We complain about the government. We complain about the weather. We complain about what, it, what it, the temperature is in this building. We complain if we're sweating. We complain if we're cold. We complain if our feet hurt. We complain because we ain't got the right kind of clothes that we feel like we need to wear to go to this particular event. We complain, 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 complain. We complain about our boss. We complain about our friends. We complain about our job. Let me help you. I'm telling you, this word is challenging now. Proverbs 18 and 21, death and life is in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Listen to what he said, because we stop right there a lot of times. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. He said, but they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. He said, they that indulge in it, he said, that's what you're going to get. He said, so what, when we think about Galatians 6 and 7, we think about be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. Uh, we think about action. We think about doing things. Uh, we think about sowing into a ministry, uh, sowing into a community, uh, giving to support. Uh, and we think about how if we give, uh, then God will give back to us. Giving it shall be given unto you, pressed down, checking together, running over shall men give to your bosom. We believe that. Uh, we know that. Uh, we've experienced that. Uh, but what I need you to know uh, is that the things and the words that come out of your mouth, uh, you sow seed all the time. You are sowing with the words that come out of your mouth. 
You are sowing into your life. You're sowing into your family. You're sowing into your marriage. You're sowing into your business. Uh, you're sowing into your health. You're sowing into your children uh, with the words that come out uh, of your mouth. Holy Ghost speak. You know why? Because God needs to speak to us individually in our heart and tell us where we have gone wrong and what we're saying with our tongue. Listen to me. You may not live long enough to know it. I heard people say all my life your words carry weight. You need to know your words carry you. Your words carry you. They carry you to wherever you say. Whatever comes out of your mouth is where you're going. That's your future. That's your destiny. That's where you're going because you got to speak the word of God. You can't speak a lie. You can't tell. You can't say what the devil's telling you. You can't say what the spirit, the flesh is telling you. Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter six, uh, and verse sixty-three, he said the words that I speak to you, uh, they are spirit uh, and they are life. He said the words I don't speak to you uh, are flesh and death. Yes. Now he didn't say that, but you can interpret that. Because he said the words I speak to you are spirit and life. You and I have to speak into our circumstances, speak uh, into our situation, speak the word of God. Uh, you got to speak to your mountain. You got to speak. When David was running on the battlefield uh, to face the giant Goliath, uh, the giant looked at David uh, and spoke to him. Uh, but then David uh, turned it around uh, and spoke to the giant. And when David spoke to the giant, he said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And this day, the Lord is going to strike you down, and I'm going to cut your head off, and all the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines shall be fed to the fowl of the air and the beast of the field. That's what David had to say to the giant. Because David spoke from the voice of truth into his situation, into his circumstance. Too many people, my a friend, are, are not speaking the word of God. They're speaking from a fleshly perspective. How many times you ever heard somebody say, oh, it ain't never going to get no better? <laughs> my, my marriage is dead. It, it ain't never going to survive. It's over with. It's finished. Uh, uh, my health, uh, my, my, my granddaddy had cancer. My daddy had cancer. I'm, I'm, Cancer's going to take me out. That, that's what people say. That's words of death coming out of your mouth. You got to turn it around. You got to break the curse. Because huh? blessing and cursing. Huh? Listen to me. This is what James said. James wrote almost a whole chapter huh, in the book. Huh? He only wrote five chapters. But chapter three, huh, almost entirety, huh, entirely huh, is devoted huh, to the tongue. You know what James said? He said, you can't tame the tongue. No man can tame the tongue. <laughs> he said, he said you, you, you can't do it. <laughs> he said, men have tamed a great beast. He said, look around at what men have done and what they have tamed uh, and how, how they have taken authority uh, over uh, Big old elephant. You see elephant in a circle. Elephant doing what that little old man telling him to do. That lion, that tiger, uh, ferocious that they are, uh, have been tamed uh, by a man. He said, but that little thing right there, <laughs> that little red muscle on the inside of your mouth, listen to me, do you know why God gave you a lip and teeth? Because he put that muscle that no man can tame in a cage with a closed door. <laughs> because there are things, you people say, well, preacher, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12. Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, he said, by every idle word that proceeds out of your mouth will you be accountable for on the day of judgment. Good God Almighty. Somebody need to sew your lips shut. That's what somebody needs to do. You know what idle means? Idle means careless. It means reckless. 
It means you just say what you want to say. You give no thought to it. Some of you need a God filter. Amen. Some of you need vid angel. Amen. Remember what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Remember what the Bible said when Paul said, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, uh, casting down imaginations, uh, and, 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 and taking every thought to obedience, to the, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You remember what Paul said? And you say, Why? Do we need to tear down strongholds? Why do we need to take every thought captive? Why do we need to cast down imagination? Why? You need to do it before it gets out of your mouth. Because when it comes out of your mouth, it comes out with power. It can be power in a positive way. It can be power in a good way. It can be power to build a bridge, or it can be a power to blow up the bridge. It can be power to draw people in, or it can be a power to drive people away. It can be a power to encourage, or it can be a power to discourage. It can be a power to love, or it can be a power to hate. Because that's the power of our words. He said, for every careless word, for every idle word that comes out of your mouth, he said, by your words you shall be justified, and by your words uh, you shall be condemned. You're accountable for your words. I bet some of you going to go on a, what y'all call that when you can't talk? Word fast. A what? Word a word fast. Amen. That's what they do sometimes. They have a word fast. That means you can't speak. Maybe you need to go on a word fast until you get the right words. Praise God. And then when God gives you the right words, then you can speak it in Jesus' name. Amen. And the authority of the Holy Spirit through the power of his word. Because too many people say, Preacher, I'm just telling the truth. I'm just keeping it real. I'm just 100. That's all. I'm just, I'm just keeping it real. That's what they say. They say, I, it ain't that I'm careless. I'm just telling the truth. Listen to me. We all got some truth in this place this morning that don't nobody need to know. Amen. Ain't worth telling. Amen. If you just think about the way you was last week. Some of you thought I was going to say about 10 years ago, but for some of us, it was last week. Amen. <laughs> because we're dealing with stuff all the time. You know, I, 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 I'm thankful that we have an honest church. I, I'm thankful that there's no false pretense going on in the house of God. We're not trying to be something that we ain't. Amen. We are who we are by the grace of God. Amen. We're striving for perfection in Jesus Christ. We want to be holy because he's holy. We want to do righteousness because he's righteous, clothed, clothed us in his righteousness. Amen. But how many of you ever had a problem with a cussing spirit? Got them, uh, three people over here. Uh, there ain't nobody over here in this section. Yeah, yeah, finally, thank you, Jesus. A cussing spirit. It'll just crawl up on you sometimes. I mean, it, it'll catch you out of nowhere. Y'all act like y'all ain't nobody. I thought y'all was honest. I thought y'all was going to tell the truth. Amen. Because that's what happens in our life. If we're not careful, if we don't have a God filter, if we're not on guard, if we're not watching, if we're going to speak things of the flesh, those are the things of the flesh that are going to come out of our mouth. But those things are detrimental. Those things will destruct, and those things will destroy. You got to be careful what comes out your mouth because we're talking about the power of the spoken word. Listen to what he said. He said in verse... I'm fixing to be through. He said in verse 28, he says, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. He said, just as you have spoken to me, just as what you have said, the words that have come out of your mouth and the words that come out of their mouth is we ought to die here in this wilderness. He said, if that's what you want to do, he said, that's what I'm going to let you do. I'm going to let you just go ahead and die right here in this wilderness. What I meant for temporary is going to turn into permanent because I changed my mind. Because these ten times, these ten, Lord have mercy. You better be glad that's the law and this is grace. Maybe it was ten times because there's ten commandments. You reckon? Oh, thank God for oceans of grace. Amen. But this is what he said. He said, because... You want to die in the wilderness? I'm going to let you die in the wilderness. Because that's what you're speaking, I'm going to let it come to pass. Because those are the words that come out of your mouth. Listen to me. If you, if, if you want to turn God off, just go ahead and start gossiping. You'll turn God off. 
if you want to if you want to speak words of unbelief, just go ahead and speak words of unbelief. You're gonna turn God off, okay? If if you if you want to slander somebody, you go ahead and slander somebody, but you're gonna turn God off, okay? If if you want if you want to lie to somebody, you just go ahead and lie to somebody. That's the words coming out of your mouth. Then you go ahead, but you're gonna turn God off. And let me help you now, because if you turn God off enough times, you're going to tick God off. If you turn God off enough times and you belong to God, the Bible says he'll chastise those that he loves. Amen? God will take you to the woodshed. That's what I'm trying to tell you. God will get right with you, and you'll get right with God. It may take a few things. It may take some understanding. It may take a word of faith. It may take a word of wisdom. It may take some hardships, some troubles, some trials. God may have to take you through the fire, but God will turn it around. Let me leave you with this right here because this is so important, okay? The closer you get to the promise of God, the closer you get to the plan of God. Because God has a plan and God has a promise. But the closer you get, the less you need to say. John's Gospel, chapter 14. Remember, we're talking about the spoken word, what comes off our lips. Oh, good God Almighty. He said, he said in Matthew 12, he said, uh, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It's not a tongue problem. It's a heart problem. Out of the abundance of the heart. That means the overflow of the heart. Because what's flowing out, who's coming out? It's not a tongue problem. You say, preacher, I need a miracle. No, you need to grow up in Jesus. That's what you need to do. (laughs) You need spiritual maturity more than you need a miracle from God. Because when you was a child, you spake as a child. You understood as a child. You thought as a child. But when you became a man, you put away childish things. John's Gospel, chapter 14, Jesus is with disciples in the upper room. He's had supper with them. What we refer to as the Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread, the instituting of the wine for his blood. He's going to lay down his life. That's Thursday night. He'll die tomorrow on Friday. He takes a basin of water, a towel, girds himself, gets down and washes all disciples' feet. Jesus taught them. And at the end of John 14, this is what he said. He said, from now on, From this point forward, he said, I I won't have much to say to you. He said, the ruler of this world is coming, and he has no part in me. He said, arise and let us be going from here. That's the last thing Jesus told him in the upper room. Because he understood that he was so close to the promise. He was so close to the plan of salvation being fulfilled uh, and what God the Father had sent him for. Does anybody know that he was sent to die? He came into this world to die, to lay down his life. Uh, The cross was on tomorrow. Uh, It was the next day. Uh, He said, I don't have much to say. Uh, Can you imagine all that Jesus was going through? Uh, Can you imagine uh, everything that was in his spirit, Uh, the heaviness of heart, uh, knowing that he would be persecuted, uh, beaten with a cat of nine tails, uh, the beard plucked from his face, uh, mocked and spit upon, uh, cussed uh, for you and I, uh, that Jesus uh, would go to a cross. Uh, They would put nails in his hands and his feet uh, suspend him naked between the heavens and the earth uh, and there uh, he would be railed upon uh, and mocked uh, and die in our place but he said I don't have much to say because if I say something I sure don't want it to be in the flesh I don't want it to mess up the plan of God 
the plan of the Father. Because the promise is so close. It's so close. Whatever God promised you, whatever God spoke to you, whatever God told you would come to pass, the closer you get to it, you better get quiet. You better hold your tongue. Just so we're on the same page and you understand what I'm saying, you better shut your mouth. You better shut your mouth. Because the words that come out of your mouth, the power of the spoken word can elevate you to the place and the purpose that God has for you or it can set you back and you can end up permanently in a place that God meant to be temporary in your life.